I started looking at lichens in 1965. Who was around in 1965? <laughs> Quite a lot of you. That's amazing. As a group in the University of Adelaide at that stage were interested in where the nitrogen in arid rangelands came from. And it was been said that, some, that there were some lichens fixed nitrogen. And I was given the job of finding them. They were in fact there. They did fix nitrogen. Uh, and my first publication was in Nature, where I reported the nitrogen fixation of lichens in arid rangelands. Now, while I was doing this, I got involved with the other lichens. And one of the really amazing things was this little character. Each of those little lumps is perhaps two, three centimetres across. It's scattered across the southern Australian deserts, and it drifts up towards Longreach as well. I've even found it in Stanthorpe, or near Stanthorpe. And when it gets wet, not from humidity, but only from liquid water, it unrolls. And it's quite spectacular. And I had fun with it. And I did things like study its physiology and resistance to drought and resistance to heat. Uh, and I had a lot of fun. I got a doctorate out of that and some other bits and pieces. Oops. Ah, now I started in the desert and I still love deserts and I still love the lichens in deserts. This is a rocky outcrop at Yawa. It's a south facing rocky outcrop. It's not far from the edge of the Strelitzky Desert. And it's a magnificent cover of lichens. It's a rather strange one. It has no known means of reproduction, but it's scattered all over the West. Just a quick word about lichens. Fungus plus an alga or a cyanobacteria. Perhaps another hundred odd organisms living amongst them, including some very bizarre uh, basidiomycete in recently described classes of basidiomycete. They're well structured. The alga cell is either clasped with finger-like pads or almost like uh, the suckers on the end of frog's toes, sometimes a hostorium which penetrates the alga. And there are gradations of the degree to which the alga and the fungus interact. On one end, you just have a mat, mat of algae with fungi ramifying through it and absorbing carbohydrate. The algae are very sloppy and they leak everything. There's no need to conserve carbohydrate if you're an alga. It's the problem is how to deal with it. So they just slop it around. Now, it's not surprising that fungi have moved in amongst it and have developed these close relationships that produce, oops, we'll go back to that one, which produce stable structures, which get very elaborate. We'll talk about how elaborate they get. They produce distinctive reproductive structures. They're almost all ascomycetes, so you produce different kind of ascocarps, a full range of variation in ascocarp, which release spores, as you'd expect. You have systems whereby the alga associates with a little group of fungi and releases uh, the small fragment of, of lichen effectively, which then drifts around, and if we're lucky, starts to grow. We do know that fungal spores meet an appropriate alga every now and then and start a new lichen that way. There are a number of lichens to which we know of no apparent reproductive structure. Uh, and it may just be that pycnidia, which were assumed to be sexual reproductive structures, also function as clonal reproductive structures. The lichens aren't trivial tax taxonomically. 
42% of ASCO my seats are lichenized. Lichenization has happened at least 30 times based on sequencing data. It's possibly many more. Delichenization has also occurred. There are genera which have some species in them which are no longer lichenized. You can sort of follow the, these things through with the molecular data. And uh, each of the like, or many of the lichenizations have involved quite different fungi. If you look at the section through a folio's lichen and the leafy ones, you've got a well-defined upper cortex, a quite complex structure. You've got a well-defined algal layer running through it. There's a well-defined medulla, which is a very loosely packed area and a quite well-defined lower cortex. So the upper and lower cortex are protective. Uh, they impede movement of water and of carbon dioxide and oxygen. And in, a significant thing about the lichens is that the upper cortex is often pigmented. The pigment is extracellular. So it's laid down on the, as crystals on the outside of the hypha. So when you collect a lichen, the color often stays unchanged. And it's very easy to extract it, a couple of drops of a solvent, you can wash it out and you can start to examine it. These are photoactive. Many of them are also bacterial, uh, antibacterial compounds. They have all kinds of complex biological and physiological characteristics. My last latest projects have involved coming to grips with the lichens in what I call subtropical Australia. It's defined in terms of the interim biological, interim biological regions of Australia. Uh -huh. That's a nice patch. To the north of the patch, you're very much into the tropics. To the south of the patch, you're into the Mediterranean type climates. And to the west, you're into the desert. It's a nice group. My last count, there were 1692 species in 306 genera. One of the lovely things about lichens is that they're perennial. They don't vanish with the seasons. They're sitting out where you can see them the whole time. If you collect them, you just stuff them into a bag and take them away. That's all the care they need. This little lichen here, the little black apothecia glows white or pale bluish white if you shine an ultraviolet lamp on it. It contains a set of compounds like azanthins, which are UV fluorescent. There are another one which is probably a protective pigment to control the amount of light that gets to the algae. So remember, the algae are naturally aquatic. High light intensity is not their place. If you're going to live out in the full sun, as that one does, too much light can be a problem. During COVID, I started to put together data about where Australian lichens had been found. And the stunning thing is that the greatest number of lichen collections is the southeast Queensland bioregion. The next greatest is the Southern Highlands. So around Canberra, basically. It's one little patch in the Northern Territory, one interim bioregion from which no lichen has ever been collected. I suspect it's because no one has looked. You see the collections are down the East Coast. And I suspect that's real. I've looked in a lot of the inland areas and there aren't many. Then looked at the number of species 
and surprise, real surprise. Southeast Queensland is the area with the most lichens. Over a thousand lichens in the Southeast Queensland region, and there are more to come. Looked at where the Australian endemic lichens occurred. And again, Southeast Queensland comes out. The other area is the wet tropics. Now, when you look at Australia for species diversity, you usually look at Western Australia and look at it. It's the wheat belt that has the most lichens in Western Australia. It's all very strange. When you look at the number of endemics, 36% of our lichens are endemic. 25% of ferns, 34% uh, of ferns, 25% of bryophytes, 85 to 90% of angiosperms. Fungi we have, other fungi we have not much idea. The big difference between the angiosperms and the cryptogams in biodiversity is something to keep thinking about. Is it real? Or is it just we haven't looked enough yet? I then looked at where Australian endemics occurred with only a restricted range, where they live just within a single bioregion. And there the wet tropics jump out. Something which must live in the wet tropics hasn't got many other places to go to. It's, it's quite an exceptional area. Southeast Queensland pops up again, as does the Sydney Basin. Western Australia doesn't rank very high. Tasmania is underrepresented just because I think the interim bioregions in Tasmania are crazy. I think Tasmania should be either a single bioregion or perhaps two. But if you're doing a national thing in Australia, you can't dispose of Tasmania in just a single region or a two. Tasmania turns out to be quite rich if you divide it into the cool, wet east and the extremely cold and wet southwest. Then you get a different story altogether. Western Australia is again disappointing alive. So in subtropical Australia, we have the 1600 species. That's Australia, 1692 species, 306 genera and 74 families. Whoops, no, that's Southeast. Subtropical Australia, yes. 1692 species, 306 genera, 74 families. In the background, we have a nice parvo trema. You can see these rather thickened edges. That's a mass of structures called ceridia, which are bundles of alga and fungus just loosely associated, which can be splashed or blown away. So they're nice, they're nice means of vegetative reproduction. Looking at way lichens are around, 4,000 species roughly in Australia, 2,000 species in Queensland, 1,000 in Victoria. Canada and the USA have 3,000 species. New Zealand has 2,000 species. New Zealand is one of the world's best known and richest lichen floras. I want to move on to something quite different. For those who might want to look at a lichen somewhere, one of the common things in southeastern Queensland are small grey leafy lichens. You have this one, grows to a couple of centimetres across, perhaps five. The lobes are very close, they're closely joined together, little black apothecia with a silvery grey margin. And then you have this one. The lobes are distinctly separated from each other. Little black apothecia without 
the Silvery March. They're different orders, but they look very like each other. They have different gray pigments. This one has a gray pigment, which is ultraviolet. If you shine a UV lamp on it, it's bright gold. Mm. And another one, the lobes are again quite distinctive. They're quite separate. You've got these beautiful little lobules around the edge. And towards the middle, the lobes have serenia on them again to make very pronounced. And they've got to look at a, a palm trunk. This is all on the one palm trunk of the Botanic Gardens. You'll find 10 or so species which look rather like these. If you can look at them carefully and start to sort them out. With a bit of a care, you can learn to separate them. This is something also on the same palm trunk of the Botanic Gardens. You can see the little one, the small back of the fish there, in the scale. These are up to two centimeters across in the lobes. And they have a different reproductive structure. They're little well-developed knobs, which we presume get broken off in the rain and washed around the tree trunk and they have reproduced. So size, color, method of reproduction are the sorts of things we start to look for. There are 10 lichen genera account for 30% of all of Australian lichens. When you're looking around Brisbane, one of the most common lichens is this one. It looks like someone has splashed weak yellow paint across rock surfaces. Or was it someone's washed out a yellow paintbrush and sloshed the liquid onto the rock? Again, if you shine an ultraviolet light on it, it's brilliant gold. It has these funny little reproductive structures where just pustules burst out and little bits of alga and fungus are scattered across the landscape. Mm -hmm. Apothecia don't have to be round. The family Graffidaceae has characteristic, or well, half the family Graffidaceae has characteristically elongated apothecia. So these could be up to three or four millimeters long. And they're quite distinctive when you're looking around in the field. One of our most enigmatic lichens is this one. It's in all sorts of places. If you get a tree with a smooth bark in southeast Queensland, this is on it. <coughs> My guess is it's Arthothelium, but I've never seen it with any reproductive bodies on it to tell. It must have them. Otherwise, it wouldn't be growing over this tree in, the, in, in South Bank. Every one of these fig trees in South Bank has it. It's rather fun to think that each of these bags each of these bags often represents a single spore or a single reproductive organ of some kind landing on the tree trunk. And the rate of growth is indicated by the vertical growth and the expansion of the tree trunk is taken up in the horizontal growth. As the tree trunk stretches, the lichen stretches with it and fills in the gaps. So there's, I think you can do some kind of complex mathematics working up growth rates in time by relating width to length and position on the tree trunk. It's in little bits here and here. Now, there are lichens almost everywhere you look. One of the worst habitats for lichens is a eucalypt forest because they burn, heat kills lichens, and eucalypts shed their bark. And if they don't shed their bark, it's fibrous and just quietly fades away. You'll find lichens in all kinds of places. They're easy to collect 
They're easy to observe. The systematics is basically set out for us now. That's what I bring up. In the end, one of our recent tax delights. The genus Calaclarca is worldwide, or was worldwide. This is in Banff, in the Rockies. This is Calaclarca out there, Broken Hill. It's a, it was a very large genus, many hundreds of species, and nobody could find any way of breaking it up until the molecular people got to it. They have now turned it, the last count, into at least 68, perhaps more, probably more genera. And they're scattered through three or perhaps four subfamilies. And my feeling is they're all good. Mm. We're looking at a diversification perhaps 40 million years ago. As continents drifted, you then had diversification over a very long time within continents and then subsequent movement. So we now have a nightmare patch of series of diversifications taken in isolated places over a very long time. The only way you can separate the genera in some cases is by sequencing. So the genera are described in terms of sequences. So the difference between one genus and another is the letters. But if you take the information, you, you can still produce a key to all, all the things that look like this. There's still this big group. You can't separate the subfamilies one from another. Often you can't separate genera one from another. It has to all be done on the basis of which species you're looking at and what unique characters they each have. So we have this marvelous new batch of genera. Uh, there's a genus my old friend Rex Wilson. There's a genus my friend Jack Elix. In fact, there's a genus Jack Elixia, uh, which has the species Elixia in it. There's a genus Elixia, which has the species Jack Elixia in it. It's when you have to find 68 new genera. It's hard to find names, especially when they have so few attributes to go, go by. But every permutation and combination seems to exist. Just in case you might think that all colored parkers are yellow, there's some that aren't. They have lost the yellow pigmentation which was there from the beginning when the genus or well, the whole family started to segregate it, had a yellow pigment. There's some now which have evolved and no longer do have the yellow pigment. So there's every variation. Yellow pigment or not, in the palace lobules. Yellow pigment or not, in the margin of the apathies. Yellow pigment or not, disc of the apathies. And a range of different yellow pigments all interrelated. So the complexity of lichens, the small number of attributes you've got to look at or test by chemistry. And my mate Jack Ulix used to identify his lichens by starting with nuclear magnetic resonance. The number of attributes you've got to work on is limited. So the amount of history you can check by chemistry or morphology is limited. But the DNA, is very good at preserving the intellectual story. Now, one of the things people like me want to see is collections, good collections. Influential in my career was Dr. Eichler in the Adelaide Herbarium. He gave me another good piece of advice. One occasion when I was visiting the herbarium, he took me aside and said, Mr. Rogers, the vault has already enough bad specimens. 
you need make no more. If you want to collect a lichen, it's usually easy. They're tough. They don't have to be pressed. They don't have to be photographed fresh. They don't have to be mollycoddled. You can chop a bit off the bark and stick it into a paper bag or get a hammer and chisel and build it off a rock. Put it in the paper bag. Some off soil and put it in a paper bag. If it's growing on a leaf, you can make it a leaf. Put it in a paper bag. They're tough. But they grow exceedingly slowly. So here's a balance. Taking enough to be useful and not so much you destroy several hundred years of growth. One of my horror stories was out in the far west. I found a rock face covered with a beautiful lichen. My guess is it was many hundred years of growth. So, so I sized up very carefully and got my hammer and chisel and we can't take off the sticky and the whole rock face will just crumble to dust. You can stand there and think, oh my God, what have I done? You think, oh, hundreds of years of growth. Tap. You hope a little piece, perhaps that size would break off. So I took an edible sample. I didn't quite shed a tear. I kept the, the data, and I had a record of where it was, and all the vegetation around it was. So we need that for that good location data. If you make much about the vegetation, do. You don't have to notice colour. Just put it in a bag and carefully hold it down and bring it back. Make sure it's a big enough sample to be used. But don't destroy a hundred years of growth needs. I studied lichens growing on rainforest leaves. I thought, I thought, okay, they're growing on leaves. So if I watched them for three years, I should be able to see their whole life cycle. So how long does it leave? Any, any guesses? Mm -hmm. Well, the half-life the leaves I studied in the rainforest at Mount Glorious was 13.4 years. So I sat up there every three months in the rainforest, even in the summer, you needed a jacket on, otherwise you froze. And I observed the lichens on every leaf of some shrubs. And a mathematician got onto it with me. And from my three years study, we worked out the average life of a leaf. Half the leaves would have lived 13 years. A quarter of them, 26 years. An eighth of them, 52 years. And when you look, you had these elderly leaves with their petioles deeply embedded in the wood of the shrub. That we have misunderstood what's happening in rainforests. It took three years for so, a lichen the size of a pinhead to appear on a leaf. And you ask then, how old is a lichen that's 15 millimetres across on a rainforest shrub? <laughs> These are strange beasties. They're strange as far as being ascomycetes. So there's a huge diversity of them from strange groups. But they're fun. I really have come to enjoy them. For my first start in the South Australian deserts, when I was a skinny kid, you know, I only weighed 70 kilograms. <laughs> and my beard wasn't grey. And I didn't mind rolling a sleeping bag down on the ground of the desert and just going to sleep on it and waking up with frost all over me. I just wouldn't do that sort of thing anymore. But I'm hoping but the sort of work that's happened in the last, what's it, 1965 to now, 50, oh, French, <laughs> 50 something years, um, yeah. we've seen a, a, 
big turnaround what we know about Australian lions. We know enough now to build stories about where they are and what, what happens with them. So thank you for listening. If some of you might even think one day about collecting a lichen, especially if you're in the north, our yeah. collections from North Queensland are inadequate. Our questions from South Queensland are also inadequate, but the North uh, wouldn't believe how poor our collections from the Mackay area are. If you're there and you think you can collect some lichens, collect nice ones, good, good data, and bring them back to the herbarium, please. Thank you, guys. If you ask me anything, go ahead. said uh, collect good data what data do you need for lichens location mm -hmm. uh, the substrate what, what are they growing on usually it's self-evident but sometimes it's not if you can give us aspect that can be useful if it's growing on a plant if you can give us the species it's useful what's it's nice to have but uh, it helps other people understand and look for where it might be. But it's basically fairly simple. There's not the sort of pernickety stuff you need with basidiomycete for fruiting bodies because these are resilient. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. A question from Sophia Solanek online. She said, How large is an adequate size of this? <laughs> <laughs> For some lichens, the biggest you'll ever find them is the size of my little fingernail. And that's a large one. Uh, if it's a big lichen, uh, think about uh, the size of your palm. Every now and then you may want to take something bigger. If you've got a lichen which has lobes two and a half, three, four, seven metres across, you're going to have to take something bigger to get an idea of what it's like. Yeah, how long is a piece of string? Mm -hmm. uh, look at the lichen, try and get enough to represent what you're looking at. By and large, it's, uh, what's that? 10 centimetres across will do the job. So unless if it, if the whole lichen is very big, just a section of it what it's, what's needed. If it's very tiny, often you'll only find you've got it when you're looking under a dissecting microscope, looking at a piece of bark or a twig, and then you'll find it's there amongst it. Penelope Sheridan is asking, um, she's in North Queensland, can she send you a picture of specimens and, will you let, and, and you let her know if they would be useful to collect? Do you need that feedback before you, you collect? Or? No. no, pictures are almost useless. Yeah. Um, so just collect? Just collect. Just collect. Um, is, is, uh, are our collection permits, do they include lichens or do you have yes. to say that? Yes. They're fun. The opposite of lichens, yeah. They include fungi. They are fungi. Excellent. Fungi. Yeah. And that was, um, oh, sorry. Rod, there's uh, lichens everywhere. What eats them? What's their main predators? They seem to survive pretty well without doing anything is chewing away. They invest quite a lot in chemicals. A lot of their chemicals are quite nasty. Uh, a lot of them are toxic, at least to, not just to microbes, but also to insects. One of the old stories, which is well documented, is that the lichen, the Romans used to stuff rat skins with Lotharia volpina, which is a bright yellow lichen, and toss them around the walls where the rat skin die, because the lichen was so toxic. There aren't many lichens that are that toxic, mm -hmm. but they are, have another rather nasty bioactive compounds in them. Very sophisticated bioactive yeah. compounds. Mm -hmm. I noticed that with the, the, the distribution and the number of species, there were high concentrations in, say, southeast Queensland and Hands. Now, do you think that's a, a, a population bias relating to collection of species, or do you think it's just the lichen, lichen, the lifestyle uh, around those areas? Yeah. So I think the distribution was it the former one, 
where it was just... That's the number of collections. Is there a bias that relates to population? And in other words, are there more specimens collected in those areas where there are higher populations? Yes, I, I'm sure there is. Well, equally, I'm sure from my collecting that this is a fairly realistic thing too. That there, uh, uh, for instance, the Rugolos South uh, fire region is well collected. But it also has a quite large number of species and a quite number, high number of endemics. Um, and that's not a heavily populated area by any means. Oh, okay. So I think it's, this is, is real, the impact, the effects are real, but perhaps exaggerated. Um, this area is, I've collected fairly heavily. The Rugolo area I've collected fairly heavily, even out into the Mole regions. Uh, this area, which was the Darling system, there is almost no likeness. They're very, very hard to find. Uh, it's the cracking clay soils. There's nothing much for to grow on. There's none can grow on the soil. There's almost no rocky outcrops. So for me, these are about true. Vanessa had a question online and it was, have you ever eaten lichen? I know that some cultures make bread out of them and some make spices. No, <laughs> I haven't. Um, they are used in some cultures, in inland, inland areas of China, they used to make soups. Uh, I think they make a fairly bitter soup. I guess they are dealing with the mucus from the fungi and probably also around the algae as well. You're pulling out some carbohydrate thickness. Are there some for medicinal purposes, you know, like penicillin, some fungi origin? Is there anything? Some of them, there's a number of antibiotics. Um, they're all one of a weak, very weak antibiotics. But their chemistry is one of the things that uh, organic chemist products are really very interested in. Because there are a few whole classes of compounds that are not known for anyone else. Lots of complex cycling structures. It's a weak antibiotic. Brandon and I spent two, three months stints on Gluebot Station in the Mallee in South Australia, and the whole area was covered with lichens. On the soil. And uh, <clears throat> if, if we got heavy rain, you could actually sort of see them move in front of your eyes. What was doing the pushing? They swell. Yep. That's why I did my PhD on the South Australian arid lands. Uh, a place that would be hard to put a pencil point down without hitting a lichen. Uh, they swell. And as they grow, they push against each other and you get cavities. It patches perhaps that round that are domed with a cavity underneath. And they're quite green in colour, these things. Yeah, they'll be pink or brown when they're dry, mm -hmm. and they go darkish greeny brown when they're wet or quite green. Yep. They change the soil moisture attributes quite dramatically by having these cavities that can mm -hmm. hold water. You don't get water moving across the soil surface. The corrugation holds it. They're quite important ecologically. Mm -hmm. And that soil had a cryptogamic crust on it. Would that cryptogamic crust have minute lichens embedded in it? Well, the whole, the whole soil crust in some cases is lichens. Yeah. Uh, about, uh, about 40 something species. And they can, some of them fix nitrogen, uh, very big variety of things. So they are, they're ecologically important in managing water infiltration, managing soil erosion by wind, changing the nature of the seed bed. So um, one of the pictures you had was multiple lichens on the same tree or log. Yes. Um, do they often live complementary or do they also compete 
and, can, and will I, fight for real estate. They, they compete. Uh, they grow one over the other. Uh, some will grow up against each other, and you see a reaction zone where they meet. You get well-developed black lines mm -hmm. where they, they end. That's it, Individuals of the same species will show the same reaction as another species. The front line. Yes. Uh, they seem to be quite territorial. Mm. And sorry, one more question. Um, in terms of DNA testing, is it do you look at the same region as you do with with typical fungi like ITS one to four, or is it has its own regions? Or? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't paid any attention to it. I'd like to hear what the what the fungal the molecular people tell me, mm. and I believe. Mm. Yep. I believe. <laughs> Penelope um, has another question online, and it's, are some lichens showing resilience to climate change or the reverse? Do we have observable data yet? I don't think we know. My guess is they will mostly be quite sensitive. They're very slow growing. Uh, they're often very selective, but there are some strange things. We know that in some lichens, at least, the strain of alga, which lives in the margin of the lichen, that was with a new frequent growing area, is not the same as the strain that lives in the middle. Mm. And the strain of alga in a lichen growing in a shady place is not quite the same as a strain growing in a sunny place. So, there's the slow response times. There's this enormous subtlety in the relationship between the fungus and the alga, which is a fairly new discovery. Uh, we know the balance between the fungus and the alga is very delicate. Uh, you can only grow a lichen under conditions where neither the fungus nor the alga can survive. Uh, it depends on the tension between the two to keep them both under control. So you would have got a balance. What happens with climate change? Who knows? Very few people have studied these things. I did back in the 60s, but the lichen I studied turned out to be extremely sensitive to heat when wet. Didn't mind 70 degrees Celsius for half an hour if it was air dry. But it collapsed with 30 degrees Celsius for half an hour if it was wet. It was a desert lichen. Mm. So you have these complexities and interactions that just haven't been looked at in half a century. Mm. Bizarre creatures. I think you mentioned the four keys. So is there a, a set of keys that you can that are locatable to help you get? I know there's complexity there, but are there some keys? Yes, I've written them. Um, <laughs> so they're, they're patchy at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working over them and using them to detect errors. There are multiple errors. I've been working on them for 30 years. So there's accumulated errors, the corrections which haven't been carried all the way through. There's new information which hasn't been adequately incorporated, but they help much better than my memory. So, uh, I'm probably the best person to try and get them from. They're probably online somewhere. Mm -hmm. Actually, Vanessa would know where they are online. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you, should, you should get that information put somewhere. Uh, maybe up on our web, web, web page. We yes. Thank you, Rock. Any more questions? How do you collect these jelly lichens? There are some that are so wet, like, do you need to put them to dry first? Well, <laughs> They're mostly, you know, when you're looking for a lichen, they're mostly air dry, unless they're collecting fairly shortly after rain. Um, if you collect them wet, if you just stuff them in a paper bag and let them dry, 
they'll be right. Don't let them stay wet. They have to dry. If you leave them wet, they will fungi will attack them. They'll go mouldy, which is terrible. So sad. Uh, the fungi strike back. So collect them, let them dry, and they'll be fine. <clears throat> this is slightly unrelated, um, but I work in archaeology, and is there much work on age of growth of lichens tying to dating rock art and other artifacts? Do you know mm. much of the? There has been some done. Uh, in certainly in Western Europe, it's been done. You're dealing with you're looking at scales of hundreds of years. Uh, Tombstones were very good for that in, in Western Europe. But look at the age of your tombstone and the lichen growing on it. And there, the air pollution starts to become a problem. Because air quality, uh, sulfur dioxide, oxides of nitrogen are quite toxic to lichens. So in Western Europe, they've lost a lot of lichens from this from lost change in air quality. But yeah, it has been done. That's what the rate of growth is compared to the conditions that it's in. Think of, think of millimeters a year. Yeah, no matter the conditions. Uh, perhaps at a fast one, five millimeters, and a slow one, a tenth of a millimeter. And if it's more wet some years, will they grow faster? If it's more dry, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody knows. Yeah. They're inter they integrate over long times. Yeah. So there are some who are reported to be thousands of years old. Mm. Just by studies of gro current growth rates and integ integrating over the time of ages of buildings and things like that. Yeah. You mentioned the use of a UV light, which I guess might help with to a level of identification, but once you've taken the collection off the tree or the rock, does that still work or does it lose its, whatever it's called, in there? No, the dry specimen can be used for anything except sequencing. Uh, tropical lichens, cool temperate lichens can be sequenced when they're 100 years old. Uh, tropical lichens often can't be sequenced when they're a month old collections. You have to have quite fresh ones sometimes to do it. Mm. But for some reason, cool temperate lichens maintain their DNA sequencing well for a very long time. Mm. But the, the general lichen chemistry, the, the complex acids that are involved in pigments and accumulating around hyphae in different parts of the thallus, stay for hundreds of years with, with their extracellular. Mm. Anne and I were visiting a friend in Mergen and she dyed some wool with a beautiful pink colour. We said, where did she get it from? And she said, I scraped the lichen off the palm tree and put it in a jar with a warden or something. And... Yes, it's a courage. <laughs> it's gravy off several hundred years of growth. Yeah. Uh, lichens have elaborate compounds in them and they make, some of them make beautiful dyes. The classic was uh, aged stale urine and you toss the lichen into the, the wall and a quite reputable source tells us that it was well known that the pixies in the Outer Hebrides died using lichens at Orkel, which is stale urine. And you could tell that by the colors of their tweeds. <laughs> <laughs> but these lichen dyes have been used for a very long time. Mm -hmm. We'd have to discourage it now. Mm -hmm. If we had a very small population in a place like the Hebrides, it wasn't really a problem. Mm -hmm. And in a climate like the Hebrides, but in our part of the world, the lichen growth is incredibly slow. Uh, you have to avoid it. Mm -hmm. Just um, We always tend to prescribe or proscribe human values to things. And I guess trying to get in my head around the concept of lichen has always been a difficult one because I think of the fungus as like building the house and uh, the alga inside as being, now I hate to say it, 
Is it mutualism? Is it like a marriage, a happy marriage, or is it enslavement? Um, I know that the, the, light, the, the fungus controls the amount of light that the algae, and are these human values prescribable to this scenario? Who's in control? What's going on here? That's a balance. But if you go to the rainforest, you'll find a lichen hanging from a tree, the untapicus. Neither the alga nor the fungus can live alone. Together, they make habitats which weren't previously available. So they are both advantaged. A fungus can't grow 50 centimetres below a branch, nor can an alga. But together, they do. Fungus can't grow on a rocky surface in the desert, and an alga can't grow there. But put them together, and they occupy a habitat available to neither. And it appears that if either one can grow alone, you can't have a lichen. It has to be a place suitable to neither. So one, one more question. Um, what parallels do you draw to, say, coral when we're talking about different type of alga? Very close. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of analogies. Except the alga cells aren't intracellular. The, the fungus puts, clasps the alga, or in some groups has a hostorium which penetrates the alga, but they can't be separated. So there's no way of ejecting the alga. Um, but there are close parallels in the terms of the nutrition. There are different ways of dealing with stress. Thanks. Is there a wide diversity of algal species or genera that coexist with the or live with the fungus in the lichen? Molecular studies are showing there's much more diversity in the algae than we ever thought. There's diversity on the alga within species. There's diversity in the alga inside a single lichen. Um, there are commonalities. Uh, the, the interaction is appalling. And what was once taken to be a small number of algal species turns out to be a nightmare of things. And who knows what an algal species is anyway? <laughs> If you think the fungi are bad, if you start to look at things like the algae, we've got almost no characters, whatever. Uh, uh, major fire that weren't separated until 30 or 40 years ago. Um, the most common ones. So our knowledge of what, how that, of those relationships is very weak, but watch that space. It just gets worse and worse every year. It used to be simple. No longer is. It's much more fun now. Um, how many young lichenologists are there in Australia? Under 50. Under 50. Under 50. Oh, okay. So, oh, no, under the age of 50 for what the young. <laughs> I'm talking about the 20, you know, are people you know, doing yeah. down lichen, for example, you know, these days, you know. No. Is it going to die as a, as a, a science? Uh, <laughs> it keeps reducing. <laughs> Oops, I have to be very careful how I say this, don't I? Because Vanessa's listening. It keeps accumulating old fogies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Vanessa. <laughs> uh, uh, people pick up an interest. There have been very few people who have managed to make a career out of lichens in Australia. I had half a career out of it. Jackie Licks in ANU made a half a career out of it because he was professor of, organic, of chemical of bioproducts. Mm -hmm. Rex Filson in Melbourne started out as a carpenter on an Antarctic expedition and came back with the lichens. They kept him to look after them. So 
there's a woman in Canberra with, a, with CSIRO who's looking at molecular things than with lichens uh, and other organisms. So Cecile is busy with those. The answer is there aren't any new ones. For the number of people with an interest of, of significant age who are picking it up. No. There have to be some problem which needs lichens to be looked at. Arid lands could be one of them. I've got another question from Penelope. She's asking, have we ever engineered lichens? I think she means put them together, put those together. Yes, they have been grown. You know, some of them could be grown quite predictably now. Uh, they, are, they are still fairly difficult. Okay, so we, someone's grabbed an algae and grabbed the fungus and put them together and created a lichen. No, they've separated a fungus and an alga. Oh, okay. Grown them separately in culture and put them back together. Okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's easy to separate them. All right. But putting them, getting them to function again together is rather difficult. Mm -hmm. Wow. It may be because the conditions which are necessary to, to enter a symbiosis are not good conditions for either of them to live. Mm -hmm. You may be looking at this interaction of all uh, conditions so bad that you're going to die if you don't. Um, mm -hmm. And if you misjudge it, you'll die anyway. So. Mm -hmm. You talk only about algae, but cyanobacteria. How many lichens have cyanobacteria? Quite a lot. Pardon? Quite, Quite a lot. It's a newish sort of thing in the last 20 million years. <laughs> the lichens have started to take in cyanobacteria. It appears they first came in as sort of additional little invading clumps and slowly just became independent. So there's some lichens which have just, some genera have just green alga, some species in the genus will have, have just cyanobacteria, and some have structures, separate structures for both. So there's been this evolution and movement. There is one order which is all cyanobacteria, uh, which is probably an original cyanobacterial lichenization. Stranger and stranger. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, folks.